Hi, friends. So life update. I just made a pretty big, exciting, but also super stressful change. After 16 years in Austin, Texas, I moved across the country and started a new job as the United States first professor for the public understanding of science at the University of Notre Dame. Yes! I'm Kate the Chemist. She's nationally known for breathing fire, explosions, and major TV appearances. And now her mission is to bring that same notoriety to Notre Dame. A new school, a new home, a new job, the laundry list of stressful things felt endless. And when we checked in with you, you shared that there were a lot of things stressing you out too. What do I want to do? What is my career going to be? The uncertainty. Everyday life is stressful. Is there enough money? Driving. Stacking my to-do list too high. The way people perceive me, that stresses me out. Am I a good partner to the person that I'm with? You know, am I taking care of the house and myself and this and that? So I think we can all agree that stress is sometimes, unfortunately, a major part of life. And it can manifest itself in a number of different ways. It might be that uneasy feeling in your stomach, tiredness or an inability to sleep, forgetfulness, maybe your heart racing or headaches, even depression. Muscle tension, my shoulders, like my back is where I feel the most. Being short-tempered. You know, should I cry? Should I be mad? I don't even know how I feel. Anxiety attacks. Yet not all stress is bad stress. Some of us thrive on it. Am I addicted to stress? I feel weird when I'm not stressed. I'm so used to being stressed all the time and I have this, 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 and that and I need to accomplish. Healthy amounts of stress that can be good. It shouldn't overwhelm you. There are certain levels of stress that you have to go through to grow as a person. Stress can sometimes motivate. When that adrenaline level kicks in and your everything starts firing. Oof, this is me. Like when Al Roker says, please welcome to the stage, Kate the Chemist. Kate the Chemist. Kate the Chemist. I get this massive surge of adrenaline and dopamine, and that dynamic duo helps me perform on live TV. Yet for some introverts, there's not enough adrenaline on the planet to convince them to step in front of a camera. So I've always wondered if we have the exact same molecules bouncing around in our bodies and brains, how can we have such different responses to them? And is our stress getting worse? Could it be that a society gets so stressed out that it actually starts to break? So I'll admit it, I'm kind of a control freak. And during my big move, all the things I normally can handle were just out of whack. And I was really struggling. I had a conversation with my friend, neurobiologist Kosick C at the Sowers Institute and asked him why I felt so off. I think in the modern life, we worry so much. We want to control every aspect of our life. And that's actually stress. We do not accept that the life has unexpectedness built within it. The unknown can be scary, especially if you're uprooting your life to chase after your dream job. I was constantly thinking, am I making the right decision? Will I be happy in Indiana? How challenging is it going to be to make new friends? Many times in the modern life, our quest to be eternally happy, I think that causes a lot of stress on us. And the moment we are not feeling happy, we feel we are stressed. But I don't think we should equate those. Kosick's point is that even in a healthy environment, anything that sets us off our path toward eternal happiness could cause us stress. And that's one of the reasons why stress is a really challenging topic for scientists to study. It's a nuanced area of brain research. Essentially, nobody would debate that the stress has an impact on how we function, how we form memory, how to do anything. But what the debate is about where the stress is exactly acting on. Over the past few decades, scientists have started to unwind the world of stress, primarily thanks to brain MRIs. And now we're starting to understand what's actually happening within our brains during those worrisome situations. From the Sowers Institute for Medical Research and KCUR Studios in Kansas City, this is Seeking a Scientist, a podcast where science fiction meets reality. I'm Dr. Kate Bieberdorf, a.k.a. Kate the Chemist, and in this episode, we're diving straight into the science of stress, how to manage it, how to identify it when it's good, and how to alleviate it when it gets to be too much. Seriously, though, 
why did my heart race, my hands shake, my nose sweat on my first day at my new job? Was it adrenaline, cortisol? This is incredible, some kind of fight or flight thing. What's that? In that moment, I kept telling myself that my body was trying to help me, but it did not feel that way at all. I'm on no sleep, no sleep. You have stress? Yes. During our relaxation exercise? You look a little stressed. Oh, I'm stressed. <laughs> what would you know about pressure? We've got to make sure that he won't crack under any pressure at all. You know, that's why the best scientific minds have devised these stress tests. Well, I, I hope I measured up to your expectations. <laughs> I got to get out of here. I think I'm going to lose it. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. So Kosick helped me connect with the queen of stress science herself, Dr. Rajita Sinha. She's a psychiatry and neuroscience professor and the founder of the Yale Stress Center, where a team of scientists are using brain images to collect stress data. We quantify it many ways. It's multi-level. So you quantify the stressors people have faced. You quantify their body's response you know, up and down, the signs and symptoms. All of this is new, actually, in many ways. So that's what's exciting about it. So I see that you have a position in both psychiatry and neuroscience. So what intrigues you about both of these fields? And do you have a favorite? Ah, that's a great question. Well, ever since I was young, I was fascinated by how people behaved and choices they made and what drove people to act in the ways that they did. And what I realized as I started to explore that was there was this whole field of psychology and the mind. And as I looked more into that and learned about that, I realized that that's actually totally fused in with the brain. And the areas that we are talking about then are really psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience. So I think in my mind, those are completely overlapping. If I had to choose in one way or the other, it's because I'm driven and my passion is to help people. I would be in the side of psychology and psychiatry, but you can't do that without understanding the mechanisms and the substrates and what drives who we are and who we become. It's so wonderful because my mom, my dad, and my sister are all psychologists. And so they love to talk about how we're feeling and they love to pick people's brains, just like you, because they want to know the intricacies, the science of it. So from a scientific perspective, how would you define stress? I would say the experience of feeling challenged, feeling pressured, threatened, or overwhelmed, or the pain and distress of that experience can all be part of what we think of when we think of stress. What would a common stressor be? There are so many different types of stressors, right? Somebody is chasing you, threatening you in a way that you are need to run for your life, or somebody, God forbid, points a gun at you or a weapon at you. There are, you know, climate-related stressors. You've got a hurricane coming, your, your house is going to be exposed to some drastic external uh, things. But there's work-related stress and there's uh, family stress, balancing that. That's the pressure of, you know, you've got too much to do. That's a stressor. But there are also internal stressors. So if your body's recovering from an illness or you are in acute pain or chronic pain or have, uh, God forbid, extreme hunger or extreme sleeplessness, for example, those can all be situations that drive the stress response and that make us stress. Biologically, is there a reason why we experience stress? So you talked about the gun example or running for your life. So what happens in those moments specifically? We have a very robust biology of stress. We have a hardwired response uh, whole system and substrate for responding because we are wired for survival, both individually to survive, but also for a species to procreate and to keep the species going. And of course, humans like to think we're very special and unique, but we're no different than other animals and other species, whether they're little microbes or they're fully developed individuals, humans. We all have a biological stress response. Let's say you're going for a hike and then suddenly a bear appears. In that split second, your amygdala, the part of your brain that handles our emotions, will send an SOS signal to your hypothalamus. 
I like to think of the hypothalamus as those 1950s telephone operators. Long distance. Operator. I'm it's the calling. section of our brain that uses our nervous system to send lightning fast messages to the rest of our body. That's how we know to freeze or run in an instant. That response is what we've come to call fight or flight or tend or befriend. But Rajita says this is only one part of the stress response. Because if you think of the survival mode, that has very much driven the thinking about fight or flight and freeze. But that is not the only thing we do. We do a lot more than surviving. In fact, what we've learned, what the new science of stress, what I like to call the new science of stress, has taught us is that uh, we're learning about cells and neurons, our brain cells, but cells in our body. And one of the things that's very critical and main function of the biological stress system is adaptation. In fact, research out of the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics shows that our cells know when we're in a stressful situation and they form membraneless compartments that help us survive in the moment and then recover more easily after the stressor has been eliminated. But what happens when we encounter a lot of stress at once? Like when I was going through that big life change. At the time, I couldn't remember anything. What was going on inside my body then? We all will feel our heartbeat faster. So you might feel it in your chest. You might feel it in your stomach, your muscles. Your face may change. Your voice may change. What you say will change the pressure of it. But we also sometimes act out our stress, um, whether you're slamming a door or you're running away from something. That's the behavioral side of it. And then there's the cognitive side, which is what you're talking about, which is that I can't remember a thing. I feel like my attention has gone. I jump from one thing to the other. I feel like I can't complete a task. The focus has changed. There's a biological reason for this. When our hypothalamus communicates with the rest of our body during stressful situations, it uses a molecule called the corticotropin releasing hormone, which makes its way over to the base of our brain right behind the bridge of our nose to find the pituitary gland. Here, another molecule is introduced, the adrenocorticotropic hormone, which hustles down to our kidneys to find the adrenal gland. And this is when that stress hormone cortisol arrives, allowing for our bodies to stay on high alert until our perceived threat disappears. To put this into perspective, people with Cushing syndrome have something called hypercortisolism, a condition where the chronic exposure to high levels of cortisol trigger neurological symptoms like muscle weakness or something I experienced recently, difficulties with memory and concentration. Those are all part of this stress biology I'm talking about. Okay, they have lots of different functions. They're part of our arousal biology, waking, sleeping cycle, our food intake, responding to food, but they're also very triggered and stimulated by stress. So cortisol, for example, gets a bad name. People say, oh, that's that stress hormone. You know, when you have those stress hormones, it's not good. But let me tell you, none of us would be able to live without the stress hormone cortisol, just like we would not be able to live if we did not have our stress biology. Acute increases in cortisol actually gets our immune system going and gets the immune system ready to fight disease, fight the viruses and, and microbes that, that we are all always being exposed to, whether it's breathing in or through our gut and other places. And so you want your cortisol rhythm to be really jazzed up and flexible and dynamic. We want to see it going up and down. Cortisol has a nice, what we call diurnal rhythm, meaning it has a rhythm for over 24 hour cycle. And we want it to be a nice rhythm, not one that's flattened out. Now, here's where the rub is, that in fact, when we get chronically stressed, it could be that not only is that cycle and that nice up and down that happens during a 24-hour cycle goes to whack and becomes more flat, you start to have your basal levels go up. And then it doesn't go up when you, when you do get challenged or you do get stressed. And so then those signals that are relying, those areas of the brain and the body that are relying on that signal to tell me what to do so we can adapt and, and bring everything down. That signal is missing. So things go out of whack. In other words, if you're distracted on that hike, thinking about your new job or your heartbreaking breakup, you might not notice that mama bear in your path until it's too late. 
So there's a delicate balance. We need some stress to keep us alert and safe, but too much stress can overload our brain, and that's when we start to lose control. That's right! We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure! We've got too far! There's too much to lose! We've got to keep our in these unfortunate moments, humans instinctively look for a quick hit of dopamine to try to level out. We're drinking more. We have a massive obesity epidemic and uncontrollable chronic stress. In 2019, Regida was featured in the hit HBO documentary, One Nation Under Stress. Hosted by Dr. Sanjay Gupta, the documentary focused on the role that stress plays in what scientists in the field call deaths of despair. Americans are turning to drugs, alcohol, and food to cope with life's curveballs. And to the surprise of no one, when uncontrolled, all three are having a negative impact on our overall health. Could this be one of the reasons why the life expectancy in the United States is dropping faster than any other developed demographic in the world? Americans are now experiencing the highest levels of stress, anger, and worry in a decade. So let's talk about two big collective things that Americans went through. Um, I should, we could expand this out, but the pandemic was pretty stressful for all of us. And we have an upcoming election. And so 72% of Americans have stated that they are stressed about this upcoming election. So let's start with the pandemic. We absolutely saw high, high levels of stress. And that was being reported. And, you know, there was not only high levels of stress, there was increased levels of binge drinking, there was increased levels of drug use that was tied to the pandemic period. There was uh, increased levels of weight gain, for example, that was reported in children and in adults. Parents were stressed. It had the unpredictable feature. None of us knew who was going to get infected next. And then it was chronic. It was repeated in the sense that there were waves of it coming back. And then it was very intense. So those are features that we like to use to kind of say, how bad is this, right? That was a very difficult period, and there was a lot of talking about how to take care of yourself. People had to stay home, so you couldn't you know, meet with your social groups as easily, but thankfully, we all got on video and Zoom and FaceTime and other things, which helped a lot. But we certainly uh, had to face some uh, pretty negative consequences. And things like the election, I do think that people are, are stressed about it. Again, there's unpredictability there. There's the sense of not being able to control the outcome, which can be stressful. And there's a lot of sort of things hit news hitting us. That's uh, fake news now, which used to not be there in previous uh, elections. You don't know what to believe. I do think the one thing that is perhaps a redeeming quality is that we know when it ends. But this leads us to, can we do anything even under chronic stress conditions when you don't feel like there's anything you can do to change something? things that have made you upset, sad, mad, and the ability that you can't do anything to change it in the moment. This is how I define emotional stress. And emotional stress is the least talked about, but is the most pervasive in so many ways. So that has allowed us to start to think differently about what is this biology about? We've gone back to the basics. We've gone back to say, why do I feel this my chest popping out of me? And why do I feel my stomach in a clench for days? And what is that all about? Why am I slamming the door? And then I feel perfectly okay after a a little while or it passes. For the bear in the woods, eventually you will get away from the scary animal and then the stressor is eliminated from your life forever. However, it's possible that the trauma from the experience can stay with you and continue to cause you further stress. And what about the things in life that are constant, all the other stressors that you can't get away from, like taking care of your children and paying the bills? Yes, there's the run thing and you took care of it. But now you can't run anywhere and you can't sleep. Well, what is sleeplessness telling you? It's telling you it's it's like a stress sign. People would say, but how do I know when I should care about it? You know, because sometimes I'm stressed and then I'm okay. I talk to my friend and I'm fine. How do you know when you should pay attention to it? So we would say when it's not letting up, when it comes back and it keeps coming back in the week, then that signal, your body's saying, wait a minute, I'm here, I'm here, take care of me. Up next, we're getting into what you've all been waiting for, tips and tricks to regulate that stress.
When your body is sending off those alert signals to take care of yourself, that's when you need what Dr. Rajita Sinha refers to as a stress buster. For me, it's yoga or a kickboxing class. For my hubby, it's 30 minutes with his Kindle. Basically, it's any activity that you can do to bring your cortisol baseline back down. When we asked you, you brought up a lot of the popular time-honored ways to cope with stress. Drink. That's why they have That's why they have happy hour. I practice yoga on and off yoga retreats here and there. I take the time to feel what's going on. I process the entire event in its totality. Traveling. Music helps me. The right kind of music will change my whole mood, will change my whole mindset. Breathing exercises, meditation, yoga. I get a massage once a month. That or I tell everybody I need a wide berth. <laughs> Sometimes it's just simple as being by yourself. I think it's really important to take quiet time every day. Take a deep breath. Separate yourself from the situation. Regita, do you have some stress busters that you'd recommend? What I call the low-hanging fruit is what we should all be considering and thinking about. Exercise is good. Talking to a friend or a family member, somebody you're close to, just talking. Our body is actually wired to partake in these things to help us reset. Nutrition is really important. Healthy food is really important. So the difference between eating something that's heavy versus light and tasty and savory still and how you feel about it and how much focus and attention you might feel after that is an important component of the nutrition. Being outdoors. So exercise is one thing, but even physical activity, working, being outdoors, being in pleasant environments, our sensory systems, there's some very nice research about taking a walk, even just a leisurely walk, exposing yourself to natural elements. The beach, the water, the sunlight, mountains, a park, greenery, for example, trees that are full of green actually have a calming influence on us. And then some people have other ways, really ice cold towel on their face or take even a cold plunge, which some people like to do. So there's lots of different stress buses. And in fact, just as stress is uniquely individual in many ways in the way that we experience it, the stress busters are uniquely individual. I had one person, I said, well, what do you do to, to take care of your stress? And they go to a drumming class twice a week. Well, that's fantastic. Because when we break down the science of this, it's really neat because we use our muscles and our body to give send signals up to the brain for resetting. And that is just beautiful. So let's go to the negative side a little bit here. So some of our listeners, we asked them, like, how do you relieve stress? Some were great things, yoga, music, quiet time. But I heard alcohol a lot. Alcohol has been around for thousands of years and humans have partaked in it, I think, the amount and the different variety that's available now is more than ever before. So alcohol just naturally is, you could think acutely in a dynamic, in the moment kind of way, it, it's a sedative. So it brings the body down. Now, even there, it's a very interesting drug. It's what we call biphasic. So it stimulates and then it's a depressant. Okay. So this is what people like to catch. I think Across the board, the issue with these different substances or food or nicotine is that if you do a little bit of it and you catch a little bit of it and you move away from it, it's going to be okay for your body. Your body can handle it. But at the end of the day, a lot of these things, including food, are very active, what we call a biologically active. Food may be nourishing, some types of food, others are less so. These same cells that we talk about, they're all stress sensitive, meaning that we talked about a stress biology. They are all activators of your stress system, which is why people say, hey, I want to, I'm stressed out, let's go to the bar, and they drink. And the downside is that you have to be careful because they're sneaky. Yes, they might bring something down, but what happens after a little while? What happens when you have the second drink? And now your body, especially in the context of alcohol, starts to adapt to the stimulus that it's impacting on. Remember, I, we talked about what's the purpose of stress, maybe survival, and then I talked about the fact that that's not it and that's not enough. Uh huh. In fact, that's why it's inadequate to say that the fight or flight is the only purpose of the stress response because adapting is the key piece. And the reason why we cannot forget about it is 
that anything that is touching our cells and making the cells adapt to it are going to change those cells. So now it's not the environment and the stressors that you have. Now you have alcohol changing those cells and alcohol changing your stress response. Interesting. What we have learned is that as you start to drink more and it's sneaky, so you didn't feel the effect after that second drink. Now you want that third drink. That's what I mean by it being sneaky. And the other little secret is, unfortunately, both with comfort foods and with alcohol and cannabis, for that matter, so as all psychoactive drugs, is that they're stress sensitive. So when you are under stress, it's going to change your baseline. It's going to change where you are and how much you want it and how much you need it to have that depressant effect or the up effect. So it's very dynamic. And it actually, over time, People say, oh, it affects my brain. It makes my thinking. But the first thing it's affecting is your whole stress biology. And so be careful. Basically, anything that will help you slow down your brain and focus on the things you can control is a step in the right direction in reducing stress. But that can be quite difficult to do in chronic situations, like if you're a caretaker for someone with a terminal illness. We say this to parents, to young parents. Take care of yourself so you can take care of your child. So you have to pay attention to yourself. Before you think about what you can do with chronic stress, you almost have to diagnose it or you have to say, assess it. And we all have to be our own little investigators because our bodies are wired that way. They're giving us those signs and signals. So we talk about that. We give people a little sign and symptom checklist and we say, this is what's going on. Which of these have changed or which of these do you have three or more times a week? you have it that often, I think your body's telling you something. It means let's take care. Prioritize yourself. If you've ever thought, I feel like I'm breaking or I can't do this anymore, it might be your brain finally putting words to the overload of molecules swimming around in your body, the ones that are throwing your baseline off kilter. If and when you ever feel this way, it's your body trying to communicate that it's time for you to call your bestie and take a little advice from the TV show Parks and Recreation. Once a year, Donna and I spend a day treating ourselves. What do we treat ourselves to? Clothes. Treat yourself. Fragrances. Treat yourself. Massages. Treat yourself. Mimosas. Treat yourself. Fine leather goods. Treat yourself. It's the best day of the year. At the Yale Stress Center, Rajita works with a group of powerhouse scientists, each with their own expertise, including Dr. Kushu, who's looking at stress epigenetics, Dr. Verika Milivojevic, who's investigating the relationship between stress and addiction, and Dr. Elizabeth Goldfarb, who wants to know how stress affects memories. And something that has really revolutionized their field is the brain MRI. What the brain scans and what MRI as well as other scanning tools like positron emission tomography and other types of tools. But the ability to look inside the brain and the human brain, of course, we also look in animal brains, has been absolutely revolutionary because everything before then was based on symptoms, based on what people described. And we had some other tools like EEGs, so electroencephalograms and other ways but what the brain uh, scanning process has allowed us to do is really get the full spatial layout of the brain and right down to the little what we call voxels or dots or cells. If you look at an image of a brain scan, you'll see what's referred to as white matter. It almost looks like a spider web that's intricately woven between the different sections of the brain. It's a network of nerve fibers that are kind of like highways for brain communication. And what's really neat is that if we ask a person to complete a task while their brain is being scanned, we can watch different parts of their brain light up. That allows us to say where in the brain something is going on. If I ask you to tap your finger, I can tell you where in the brain there's a cell that's probably getting activated. And I'm not seeing the cell, but I'm seeing that area, that very tiny area is getting activated. And we know that signal is going all the way down to your finger for the tapping, but also there are sensory things coming up and that's just finger tapping. Now think about somebody pointing a gun at you and what, what all is going to get activated? What all is going to get uh, triggered to get the whole process of experiencing stress and responding to stress going? 
Take me through just one experiment. So you are scanning someone's brain, you're showing them images. I mean, can you like the specifics of that? How does that actually work? If we wanted to uh, see, just like I said, somebody is pointing a gun at you and you think, oh my, and it looks like a stranger and they are very close. What happens to our brains and to our bodies, right? Within milliseconds, things are changing in your brain. So to be able to see that inside the brain, what we have to do is develop an experiment in a controlled way because you could say, well, you know, the way the brain's working, that's happening all the time. Well, so we need a control condition. So we would set up an experiment where there would be a stress condition and a non-stress condition in a very simple way. And then we could show you some pictures, for example, some really awful, horrible, threatening, challenging disgusting pictures. And that could be for, you know, somebody coming at you being chased, uh, mutilated body. It could be uh, somebody being beaten. Things, images, unfortunately, we see in our real world today quite a bit. But these are images that are flashing at you. And of course, it's registering in our sensory areas of the brain, but also in our putting it together. And they come at you at pretty quick frequency. And then we ask you before we start doing the images and during and after how you're feeling. So because, as I said, I would define stress as an experience. So I want to know how stressed you're feeling. But I'll also measure maybe your heart rate. I'll measure some of your hormones, your body's response to also see how is the body reacting. And then the images stop and we'll get some ratings from you and we have you relax. And we'll have the no-stress condition. And maybe in the no-stress condition, you're looking at pictures of a beautiful uh, green park, of the water and the ocean, maybe a beach, maybe even some non-relaxing kind of images. It could just be uh, objects like a table, a chair, something like that. And continue that for the same amount of time, measuring the same kinds of things. These types of experiments are allowing researchers to have a better understanding of chronic stress and how it negatively affects the human body. For one thing, it ages us. When our cells divide, they lose a small portion of their telomeres, which are basically protective casings for the ends of our DNA strands. It's usually not a big deal because the telomerase enzyme can then zip right in and tidy up the DNA. However, when we're stressed, we end up overworking our enzymes and they are not able to get to every cell in time. Think of it like a zombie apocalypse. If the medics get to the freshly bitten human fast enough, maybe they can stop the conversion and save the human. If not, well, that's how sci-fi movies get started. Welcome to Zombieland. In the case of a chronically stressed out human, our telomerase enzymes are basically understaffed and they can't get to the damaged cells before they start to die or become pro-inflammatory. And just like we talked about in our very first episode of Seeking a Scientist called Can Humans Reverse Aging, these two factors kickstart the cellular aging process. By the way, you should totally go back and listen to that episode. Anywho, we're starting to see more and more studies on parents of children with cancer or just caregivers in general because scientists can actually quantify how the stress of a sick relative is negatively impacting the caregiver's health. The same thing goes for people in abusive relationships, experiencing poverty or homelessness, living in war zones. So here's what I would throw out first as a rhetorical question. What happens when you're facing stress that doesn't have a solution? Or the solution doesn't come to you right away? Or there is no solution immediately? That you're just facing it and facing it. These are, now they're called social determinants of health, but these are chronic stressors that people face. Again, because there's this stress biology, there's only so much a cell can take. We have seen this where neurons have nice branches. They look like nice, healthy green trees. And one way to the image I want your listeners to think about is that under chronic stress, those leaves fall off. So the green starts to fall off, the twigs fall off, the branches kind of start to look faded. And most importantly, those branches connect to other branches. So when you start to have these branches, what we call dendrites, branches of the nerve cells, they start to retract. They're not making connections with each other. So you start to lose connectivity in our brains and connectivity is really important. So what you're talking about in the brain side, we see 
shrinkage of brain cells or reduction in brain volume. But at the same time, it also affects cells in our body. In different systems, uh, in different organ systems, they're affecting things differently. Some people may have vulnerability for one organ system versus another. Just in case it's not crystal clear, chronic stress can be really bad for you on a molecular level. And that's why we need to be proactive and utilize those healthy stress busters we talked about earlier. You've got to reset that cortisol baseline. So listener, I've got some homework for you. We're in the last few days of our election cycle. Please don't forget to vote. Our democracy depends on it. We're also revving up for the holidays and wrapping up 2024 on top of all the personal stuff each one of us is grappling with on a daily basis. So focus on what you can control. Be proactive and try a new stress buster. Go axe throwing. Try a Zumba class or rent a hotel room, order some room service and open that book you've been dying to read. And before I let you go, let's wrap up with some lighthearted rapid fire questions. So here's the first one. What's a funny habit you do at home when no one is watching? Ooh, what I like to do is sit with shutting my brain down and turning to my breath. And so if anybody were to look at me, I'm actually staring out just into space. But <laughs> but I, I, it's, it's sort of my chill down, stop everything, cut down on the outside and turning inward time. I love that. James Maynard is a mathematician who just got a field award, and he says the same thing. He takes his glasses off because he's so blind, and it's a way for him to reset his brain. Okay, next one. Do you have a science pet peeve? Ooh. I love all aspects of science. What is my science pet peeve? Yes, I do. You know, it learning is, is something that we're wired to do, and so why is science being attacked? That's my pet peeve. It's not good to attack science because at the end of the day, It supports curiosity, it supports knowledge. Through curiosity and knowledge, we stimulate our brains, we stimulate our own minds, we connect to other people that way. There's just so many gifts it gives us. And attacking science doesn't have any benefit. Yes, girl, yes. Okay, very last question here. So if you could live in a world where no one ever experienced stress, would you? No. We wouldn't survive. (laughs) With that in mind, I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Fred Rogers. In times of stress, the best thing we can do for each other is to listen with our ears and our hearts and to be assured that our questions are just as important as our answers. 